My name is Tiffany Townsend, and I'm the Senior Director of the Office of Ethnic Minority Affairs for the American Psychological Association. Um, I first just want to thank Chris and Julie and Anna for inviting me today. I mean, for me, you're all new colleagues because <laughs> I'm a psychologist and this is not necessarily my area. But I think I was invited because of the work that I do in communities of color. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, but I am keenly aware that I stand between you and lunch <laughs> and going home. So when I say I'm going to be short, <laughs> I mean it, right? Um, and Derek yesterday indicated that he's a storyteller. I am too. So I'm going to give like a brief story because I was so excited to be invited to participate in this very important topic um, particularly for, for my office and my constituents because I work in communities of color and we've talked about this extensively yesterday that this issue is disproportionately um, found among communities of color. And, and when we talk today, I want you to keep that lens in mind. But as I was looking through and reading and then looking at the agenda, I said, oh my gosh, I'm at the end. <laughs> I am the last speaker before we go home. And it reminded me of my college graduation. Um, at graduation, we had Oprah speak. She gave a rousing, very inspirational talk. Um, we even had an impromptu sighting from Maya Angelou. Everyone was excited. We were laughing. We were crying and hugging. We sang the hymn. For all intents and purposes, we were graduates. We were so excited. And then the chair of our uh, board of directors decided he was going to do closing remarks. And as we were standing there still holding hands, crying, excited, he proceeded to give a 30-minute closing remark statement <laughs> as we had to then sit down and realized we had to suffer through another speech on graduation day. So believe me, I learned my lesson. I will not be that person. <laughs> but I wanted to first just give some acknowledgement to my colleagues, because like I said, this is not my area, right, specifically. But we do have a colleague in our directorate that does work and violence prevention, and she's developed a program called ACT, which is a parenting program that they've now instituted in two sites, one in Ohio and uh, several, several prisons actually in Ohio, and several pr prisons in Massachusetts to work with incarcerated parents. And so this is more of a parent education program. Um, it focuses on just general kind of child development and parenting skills, but with incarcerated parents. So I'm not going to talk at great length about that because I think Christina Brown and, um, and Derek did a good job of that yesterday talking about some of the tenets of parental education programs and why we use them. And so I'm actually going to talk about it briefly more as an example as opposed to giving specifics about the program. But I will give you some contact information at the end. If you want more information about the ACT program, you can absolutely have that. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, the American Psychological Association because I don't think people realize what a big mammoth APA is. Um, we have over 120 members, which actually has dwindled in recent years, but I think all membership organizations have seen that decline. Um, and we have over 700 staff. And I know a lot of people are surprised at that. So we have over 700 staff and really, Unlike men, men, many membership organizations, our charge is to give psychology away. We really are to kind of work for the benefit of the community. And so in that way, we're not the typical membership organization where we're focused on uh, the benefits to the members. I mean, we absolutely do advocate for our members, but really our goal is to make sure that we can use the science of psychology in order to improve social 
problems. And I am really happy to be in a directorate where that's all we really do, right? We are the public interest directorate, and we focus on trying to use psychology in the public interest. My office, and which is why I think I was brought here today, is in addition to advocating for psychologists of color, making sure that we have people of color who, one, become psychologists, but two, are sitting at the table when important decisions are made, um, I also advocate for communities of color, making sure psychology is used to address issues that happen in those communities, but also that psychologists are trained appropriately so that they can address those issues. And so obviously that's the lens that I have on today. Um, as I was reading those papers, that's the lens that I had on. So how can we make programs culturally appropriate, designed specifically for the needs of those communities. And we talked about the demographics of this problem, but we didn't talk about culture, right? It's not that these people just look different from us, they are different. And even if we look the same, our culture is not the same. And so understanding those distinctions and figuring out ways to incorporate that in how you, one, see and structure the problem, but two, how you identify solutions. Right? So how many people know about the blind man, the blind man and the elephant? A lot of people are nodding their heads. Okay. So you were supposed to say no. <laughs> so um, just as punishment, you still have to hear it. Okay, so I'm going to give, it's an Indian parable that was first um, retold in the West by an American poet, uh, John Godfrey Sachs. And I'm going to kind of give you the parable. I'm going to read it because I think once I read it, you'll understand very clearly why I thought this was appropriate for this particular conference. And everybody's already nodding. Okay, I know you know it, but I'm going to read it. <laughs> so, once upon a time, there lived six blind men in a village. One day, the villagers told him, hey, there's an elephant in this village. And um, they had no idea what an elephant was. So they decided, even though we would not be able to see this elephant. Let's go and feel it to get a sense or an idea of what it is. So they went to the elephant and they felt, each felt some aspect of the elephant. And the first said, hey, said the first man, this elephant is a pillar. He said as he touched the elephant's leg. Oh no, said the second. It's like a rope as he touched the tail of the elephant. Oh, oh, no, 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 you two are both wrong. It's like a thick branch of a tree, said the third man who touched the trunk of the elephant. No, 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 it's like a fan, said the fourth man, who touched the ear of the elephant. You're all wrong. It's like a huge wall, said the fifth man, who touched the belly of the elephant. No, 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 no. It's like a solid pipe, said the sixth man, who touched the tusk of the elephant. They all began to argue about the elephant. Every one of them insisted that he was right. It looked like they were getting agitated when a wise man came uh, past by and saw this. He stopped and asked them, what's the matter? They said, we cannot agree on what this elephant is like. Each one of them told what he thought the elephant was like, and the wise man calmly explained to them, you're all right. The reason every one of you is telling it differently is because each one of you touched the different part of the elephant. So actually, the elephant has all of these elements. So obviously, you know exactly why I thought this was an appropriate parable to share today, because this area is multidisciplinary, as we know. And every one of you have come with different perspectives, looking at the elephant from your disciplinary perspective. But in many ways, we've been trained to be blind by our perspectives, and we can only see that narrow aspect of how we view the problem, right? And so in their infinite wisdom, Anna, Julie, Chris, are the wise men, or the wise people, 
so to speak, to say, listen, hey, we know that you all have different aspects to this problem, but really, we can't see the full problem unless we come together and think about the questions that should be asked using our different disciplines, but also how those disciplines can be used to come up with solutions. So I just want us to think about this really quickly. How might the discussion have looked, if they step back and they see the whole elephant, how might that discussion have looked? If they don't step back and they decide, we need to take care of this elephant, and each one very clear that they want to focus on their own perspective, what might the solution look like? Will it be complete? Will it address all of the needs of that elephant? Probably not. So I think that moral is very clear. But there's another moral to this story that is probably not as clear. What might the discussion or the argument look like had the elephant had a voice, right? So we're all looking at this perspective, all looking at this problem with our own perspectives, and at no point did they say, elephant, what do you look like? What is the problem? How might the argument look differently? How might the solution look different? Right? And so what I want to encourage you today is to say, we talked about this a little bit, and I, and I told a lot of folks, gosh, you guys stepped all over my talk. I thought I was going to be brilliant to come up with something. Hey, look, CBPR. And you guys said, yes, we know about CBPR. But one of the things that I think is important to kind of understand about CBPR is it's not just about asking for feedback on something we've already decided. It really is about asking the questions before we sit down to craft the, the solution or even the research, right? So yesterday we kind of talked about the fact that there is a, a, a kind of a plan that NIH has set forth on how you develop interventions. And part of the stages, I think um, Brownwin uh, had that very good graphic, and part of the stages has basic research, and then there's kind of intervention development. And she said, you know, most people include the community at stage two in the intervention development. I encourage you to have the, in, the community at basic research. That's a very different paradigm than how we're trained. But really what you do is you develop the relationships before you seek the funding. You develop the relationships in the community so that the community can help you identify what the problem is and how you even structure the questions, right? Because how I ask the question dictates the answer I'm going to get back. And if I structure it in a certain way, I'm bound to get different answers. So we need to have them sitting at the table, not because it just structures and gives us more um, culturally sensitive and appropriate interventions, but because it empowers the community to have ownership over what's going on in their health and in their well-being. It's about self-empowerment as well. Yeah, so, it's, so what we do is we incorporate the knowledge that you know with the knowledge that the community knows and that you sit at the table as equals. And you say that you're just as much a, of an expert in what's going on in your community and in your culture as I am in my literature. And together we can craft a plan. Together we can craft a research agenda. Together we can craft an intervention. So this is just a little bit about how that uh, CBPR, the participatory research model, works. You first use the community to even identify the concerns. So we were talking yesterday, should interventions be gender specific? Should we focus? Here at the parenting level, should we focus later at the, the actual uh, 
um, punitive, like what are the punishments? These are questions that the community, those who've actually been incarcerated, those who are children, who are now adults, who have parents who are incarcerated, these are questions that they can answer. They can help us answer some of these questions to make sure the interventions are addressing their specific needs, right? Now, I have to say, because I, in my previous life, was a faculty member. In my previous life, I had the publish or perish um, issue as well. And we know that RFAs come out and you have a month to respond, right? So the, this is all seems aspirational, but is this something that we can really do? And what I say is yes, if this is something that you start from the beginning. So you do this before the RFA comes out. You develop these collaborations as you're thinking about your research programs. And it does require a lot of groundwork. This piece here, identifying the concerns, means that you both have to learn each other's language. We have to do that when we're doing interdisciplinary work as well. That we have to understand what you mean when you say incarcerated parent. Um, you political scientists, you sociologists, you psychologists, we have to understand your language. It's the same when you're working with communities. You have to understand the language. And it requires education on both parts. It requires trust that they feel like they're equal partners and that you're going to listen to what they're saying. Um, then the other piece that I think is really important is that you integrate the community throughout the process. It's not just at one point. This is a collaborative partnership. And the most important piece, which I don't think we do, is that the research goes back into the community. It's a loop, right? So they get feedback. On, they help you interpret what the data means. And they get the information to come back to the community where it can really help. So, the ACT program, like I said, is a parenting program that's developed at APA, and I'm not going to give a lot of details about it, but I wanted to use it because it kind of gave me some examples of, of the fact that we need to focus on those who are experiencing this issue. Why do we do what we do? This is the reason why. If I gave no other take-home message, it's that it's the, these children and these parents who love their kids, most of them who've done other things, but they love their kids and don't want their kids to experience what they've experienced. This is the reason why you do what you do. And even though we may not understand that they have knowledge and information, these parents who were in the, who, who were part, participated in the ACT program, they had a lot to say about what they thought, the, how the program could be improved, what are some things that they wanted to do. Um, look, I would recommend this to others. And, and very kind of thoughtful processes. So it's important that we include those voices. Can you imagine, I mean, I think understanding the lived experiences of these, of the, the parents and the kids is vitally important. So we're kind of talking about these things in an academic kind of way, but this is the, this is, these are the lives that they have to deal with on a regular basis. And some of the things that we take for granted. Can you imagine what it's like to be in prison and hear about all the shootings of young black men when you're the mother or the father of a young black boy and the last thing you can do is to go and be with your child? How must that change the experience of their time in prison, but also how they view their parenting role, number one, but, but two, the prospect for their children. So this is what we need to consider. Again, if I have no other take home message, is for us to remember these faces, remember these lived experiences. I thank you for the work you do. I think you guys do a great job. I think there's a lot that we've learned. And I just, as you are continuing to craft your research programs, keep these experiences in mind. Thank you.